Who's excited to learn about Noah's Ark of the Flood? Yeah. Woo! That's an attitude, man. I love that. That's great. It's my favorite topic because I believe there's so much evidence that points to the truth of the Bible. And when you really think about it, this event, this, this account of Noah's Ark and the Flood is probably the most recognized event in all of human history. I mean, think about it. You don't have to even be a Christian to have heard about the search for Noah's Ark, right? Everybody's seen that on History Channel or Discovery Channel or Name Your Movie or the unbiblical Noah's Ark movie that was out just what, last year. I wouldn't recommend go seeing that, by the way. But isn't that the watershed event for everybody? If Noah's Ark could be found, wow, what, I mean, that would really point to the veracity of Scripture. Right? But but it hasn't been. And so now the secularists, the evolutions are saying, well, it never existed. There's not enough water on the, the earth to flood the earth to the you know 20 feet above the highest mountains. Uh, it was a local flood of anything. No one didn't have the technology to build a boat of that size. How did he get all the animals on the ark anyway? I mean, there's just all those things that we get bombarded with. And so the tendency then is to say, well, wow, I don't have the answers to that. So you start doubting the account of Noah's Ark and the Flood, and then, well, what else in the Bible can you really take for, for real? And so this really is a, a hinge pin for the truth of the Bible. So we don't have to be afraid, though, right? Because the Bible has the answers. We've got a God who gave his book to us so we know and so we can look at his word and, and look at what we have around us and say that makes sense. So tonight we're going to do a little feasibility study on the ark and we're going to say, was it a myth or was there a method to the madness? <laughs> so here we go. There are generally four views of the flood and the first one is that it was a historical global catastrophe. And that's the biblical view. That's what we read about in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. It was historical. It happened in real-time history about 4,400 years ago. It was a global event. It covered the entire earth with water. And it was a catastrophe because it wiped out every living thing that was on the earth. And this was the predominant view up until the late 1700s and the early 1800s. That's when evolution started, and then people started doubting what the Bible said. The next view is the historical local catastrophe. It actually didn't happen at a real, real point in history. It was catastrophic in nature, but it was a local event that happened somewhere in this Mesopotamian valley where the Tigris and Euphrates are now. It was just presented in Genesis with exaggerated language. Just to prove a point. That's what that view says. But actually, there's another view. It's called the historical global tranquil flood. That it, it actually again happened in history. It was global, covered the entire earth, but instead of catastrophic, it was tranquil. It was this smooth laminar flow that didn't leave any geological evidence whatsoever. Now, the people who like that view are the people who hold on to the gap theory. Now, I've got a whole other session that will talk about all these compromising views, so I'm just setting you up for the next ones. But the, the reason the gap people, the gap theorists like this is because they believe in millions and millions of years of the fossil record before man. And so if this was a catastrophic flood, it would have destroyed the fossil record. The fossil records are still there. They don't want to deny the existence of Noah's flood, and so it was just a nice, peaceful, tranquil event. So that's kind of an oxymoron, right? A tranquil flood. I mean, in the previous session, remember we talked about Canyon Lake George, where one week of, of heavy rain caused the dam to flow, and we, we created a canyon 80 feet deep in some places in three days. How about this picture? This is recent. 
This is in Nebraska on the Niagara River. The dam failed when an 11 foot wall of water hit this concrete structure. You can see what a little bit of water in relation to Noah's flood, a little bit of water wiped out a concrete dam, not only that, but look how it widened the valley that used to, used to have earth back here to contain the reservoir. So tranquil, or tranquil and flood doesn't seem to make any sense here. And then there's the view that this is just a myth or a legend. The Babylonians had their epic of Gilgamesh, and so even modern, or, or I would say liberal theologians, take this view that this is just some hyperbole language, and it really was just, you know, kind of a legend based on, actually, the Hebrews stole it from the Babylonians, and that's why we have the legend that we do now. So those are the four views. The evolutionary model then says that Noah's flood was either a, a local flood, if any, but more than likely it was just a myth and a legend. They say the fossil record then was formed over billions of years time as one animal form died, had some mutation before that, passed on some key genes to their offspring, and then they survived. And then over millions of years of time, this happened and slow, gradual death and buildup of sediment caused the fossil record. That's the evolutionary view. It uses index fossils to date rock layers. I'm going to explain what index fossiling is here in just a few, few slides, so bear with me. But remember, they also hold on to this uniformitarian principle, the theory of uniformitarianism. And I, I mentioned this, I think, in every lecture but it's key to understanding what their worldview is. And the, the assumptions are that only present day observable geological processes at their current rates and magnitudes are all that's required to explain the geological evidence that we see or the geological record. So that being said, the present is the key to the past. What we see now has been happening forever. So let's take a slow geologic process like river erosion, and again, we'll apply it to the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River erodes just an inch or two at the bottom of the canyon every year. It's five miles deep, so it would have taken millions of years to carve this out for the slow Colorado River. That theory totally ignores catastrophic events, even really local catastrophic events. And how many times has the Colorado River flooded and they don't factor that into the equation. But certainly it ignores Noah's flood. So what is fossil indexing? Before I dig into that, let me explain a few things. Fossils, almost every fossil is found in sedimentary rock. There's very few, sometimes on a rare occasion, where you'll find one in a metamorphic rock. A metamorphic rock is basically a sedimentary rock from all these sand grains that have come together under pressure, cemented everything together, but it's changed, it's metamorphosed by heat and pressure, and so most of the heat and the stretching destroys the fossils. So very few found in metamorphic rocks. Zero found in igneous rocks, which are made of molten material that solidifies, so that would have totally destroyed the fossils. Argument would say that you could use radioactive or radioisotope methods to date metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks. I have another lecture that you'll have to wait around for to talk about the errors in carbon dating and, and radiometric dating. But you can't use radioactive methods to date sedimentary rocks. It's because all these sand grains and the sediments come in from all different places and it gets aggregated. So the dates that you would get would be discordant. You'd have a lot of different dates out there on the same, looking at the same rock. So they don't use radiometric dating to date the sedimentary rocks. So what do you use? Well, you use fossils, right? So this is kind of a record of all the different layers here. You have the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Solarian, Devonian, all these different rock layer groups or time periods. And let's just take, for example, the Paleozoic time period. Most evolutionists believe 
It's just a preconceived idea. There's no evidence for it, and it's only based on how long they think it would take for, for one animal to evolve into the next. So those are just the time frames that are based on. But they think this lasted, or started 560 million years ago and went to 250 million years ago. So if you look at trilobites, trilobite fossils are found in the Cambrian layer. And they supposedly, again, just from, from their bias, lived for 520 million years ago. So when a geologist comes around and they say, oh look, here's a rock layer, and here's a fossil of a trilobite, since they can't date it with any other method, oh, that rock layer is 520 million years old. That's what an index fossil is. So, the problem, do you find fossils today in the past or in the present? They formed in the past, but you find, find them in the present, right? <laughs> and when you find them, do they have a date stamped on them? No. no. And so it's this preconceived idea, Paul Spadam had a date on it. <laughs> so this is the problem, right? They don't have dates on it, so the geologist looks at the fossil to date the rock, but the archaeologist looks at the rock and the age of the rock to date the fossil. See the circular reasoning that's going on here. It's closed loop circular reasoning. And there is, that's the genuine flaw in index fossils in the, the evolutionary model. They talk themselves in a circle. So who's all heard about the geologic column? Everybody's heard about the geologic column. If not, Again, it's these time periods, Protozoic, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, these are major time periods where the evolutionists believe these animals lived, dates. It's, it's kind of their, their calendar or their time timeline of when all these different animals lived. So you've got your lowest life forms at the bottom. It, you get more and more complex as you go up until you have very complex animals at the top. That's the geologic column. It's a time frame, it's a record, they say, of when these animals lived based on this, this rock layer that they are found in. So it's, it's a record of when they lived. But, a little secret, this whole geologic column right here, it's not found anywhere in its entirety across the entire Earth. It only exists in textbooks. Geologists will go to this part of the country and they'll find a small portion of it. They'll go to this part of the country, find another, and they'll stack these up and, and merge them together. And so it's one geologic column, only in the textbooks. The other thing they don't want you to know is these just appear very well graded and, and very well sorted. So that you've only got these soft bodies, single cell things here, and you only got the trilobites that are up here, and you only got the dinosaurs up here. But that's not really the way it is in real life when you find fossils. Majority are, yes, but not in its entirety, because you will find marine invertebrates throughout this entire geologic column. You'll find marine fossils on top of Mount Everest. You wonder how they got there. And, and we've also seen record of where you'll see, you know, dinosaurs below a layer that they should not have appeared in. Nobody has answers to those except for Christians based on the view that we're going to be looking at. They have another problem. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. And remember, we, we pointed out that Cambrian layer that exists down here, and the layer below that is called the Precambrian, sometimes people call it that, or if you want to get the precise, it's the Ediacaran layer, and in that rock layer, there's only fossils of soft-bodied organisms, soft-bodied life. They think that there may be light-sensing organs where they could sense light, but they had no sight. But then immediately, in the layer above that, for no apparent reason, just out of the blue, 
Now all of a sudden you have all these very complex animals with shells, exoskeletons. The trilobite has compound eyes. And nobody really understands how that gap, or, or how, you know, how that gap was filled when you got soft body and then also uh, all of a sudden these very complex animals. A lot of people will say this is the biological Big Bang. Because all of a sudden, you have all this life that has actually, they say, different body plans. These are, these are lower animals here, but these have totally different plans. And so they don't have an answer to that. And the interesting thing is that all these major groups appear in the Cambrian, <coughs> but there is no evolutionary ancestor in lower layers. That's, that's those transitionary fossils that people are looking for, right? And all of a sudden, you have all this life but no ancestors below it. They just popped out of nowhere. And they have a lot of theories. One is, well, there's an increased amount of oxygen at the time. Okay, so what does that give you? You know, so none of their arguments make a lot of sense. Google that sometime and you'll, you'll really easy point out, well, what does that have to do with it? So, contrary to the evolutionary model, we have our creation model. And here's how the, the creation model explains the fossil evidence. It was a worldwide cataclysm, and most fossils then would have been formed at that time. Massive amounts of sediment sweeping up onto the continents, bringing up the marine animals and the plants and everything that's in the bottom of the ocean, dumping them on the landmass, subsequent layers burying those, and we believe that the increasing complexity that you see in the fossil record is because the animals had a different ability to escape. So it's based on their mobility to go to higher ground as the floodwaters came in. So that's why you see at the lower levels things, the marine life that can't get to the next layer, you know, they're just buried quickly. But those animals that could get away, like the trilobites, they're scampering through. Who, who's ever been on a beach and has seen the sand crabs when they come on the beach and the, the wave sweeps them in, and then you try to grab them, what do they do? Well, they, they kind of dig down underneath because they don't want to be caught, but you know, it's that same idea. The trilobites got swept up, got buried by sediment, they were able to squeeze out, go to the next layer, and a lot of times what we see are the tracks of the animal that are fossilized in lower layers than where the animal is found. We see that a lot. And that can only happen by rapid burial. So here's the true meaning of the fossil record, right here. We have mass graves of fossilized animals that have body parts strewn apart, strewn, strewn all right in this mass grave, not whole animals, some, but not all. But these are animals that don't normally live in the same place. They live in different biomes, different biospheres. It's like having a, having a kangaroo get buried with a buffalo. You know, they don't live in the same places, but they certainly got buried in the same places. So the fossil record is not an example of when an animal died. It's a record of where they died and where they were buried at the same time, and that was as a result of the flood. So we, we've talked about then our seven C's of biblical history. We, we talked a little bit about creation. The lecture we missed, though hopefully I'll have a, a makeup session, was what is a day? You know, we'll, we'll give some, some clear definition of what a day is in terms of the Bible and creation. And then we talked about the corruption, the sin in the garden, and how sin came before death. But tonight we're talking about the third C, which is catastrophe. And when you look at the Bible, if you look at the world through the lens of what the Bible says about Noah's Ark and the, and the flood and the catastrophe that it was, it helps us to make sense of what we see in the real world. So let's start with this premise that many people think that this is just a local flood. So if that were the case, we have to dig into the Bible 
and find out what the purpose of the flood actually was. So let's begin with that. The Bible says the purpose of the flood was to destroy all life. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Not some of the time, but all the time. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, how I've been created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I'm grieved that I've made them. So God's going to wipe out all the life that's on the earth. That's, that's the purpose of the flood. And also to destroy the earth. Genesis 6.13 says, So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So to, to kill all the things that lived on the earth and then destroy the earth itself. <laughs> Only a global flood is capable of doing that, is it not? A local flood wouldn't even touch it. So let's look at the purpose of the ark then. The ark's purpose was to preserve the offspring of all life on the earth. So unlike progressive creationists who believe that God continually created as other things died, this, this says that God chose animals to reproduce after their kind. He didn't have to recreate anything after the flood. All the animals were there on the ark that had the genetic makeup to go as what we have today. So then the Lord said, Genesis 7, 2, Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive on the earth. <laughs> so the purpose of the ark was to keep those animals alive. So, again, a lot of people think this is just a local flood event, but if it was a local flood... The ark would have been unnecessary, right? I mean, think about it. I don't have to worry about getting all these animals on the ark. Why did Noah spend such a long time building the ark? If it was a local flood, man could have just migrated across the next mountain range, right? In fact, isn't that what we see today when animals sense danger, and they do, they migrate out of the danger zone only to migrate back. A perfect example that we see is Mount St. Helens in Washington. You heard the rumbling of that thing for months and weeks. All the animals left. Maine was the only dumb one that didn't. <laughs> and they were destroyed by the flood, right? There was, a, there was a man that said he had lived there his entire life. He says, I'm not moving. His house was buried with ash. So animals sometimes have more sense than people do. So, if all the animals had to come on the ark then, how big was the ark? So let, here's, let's do a little feasibility study. <laughs> this is not the ark, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, this is what you see in, in Sunday school nurseries even. Yeah. We, want to, we need to redo the walls if then we got painting murals of this on it, right? We want to paint the real picture because it was huge, it was enormous. But, but the message that we're sending here to our kids is, this is a myth. You know, Noah's Ark was a little boat that had the giraffe sticking out of it, and the elephant's looking over here like, like they're either going to be seasick or they're going to tip over the ark, right? <laughs> so, and really, you know, how many people have a real sense of what the real Noah's Ark looked like or, or how big it was? We got a, we got a few in there, okay? Here's what it looked like. This is, and I know we've got some people that have gone there, and I know we've got some people that are going. So this, this is exciting, but this is called the Ark Encounter. It is in Weemstown, Kentucky, about 30 minutes away from uh, Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. And this is a full-size replica of Noah's Ark based on the biblical proportions. Look at the people back here, and, and they're just at the back side of the lake. There's probably another 50 yards or so to get to the ark. This thing is huge. So, Are there dogs in there? Pardon? 
Are there stalls to make these kinds of There are so it, it's a it's a museum and so a lot of it is just museum place for people to so it's not packed like the ark would be, but there are representative stalls that may have been in the ark. It's it's a wonderful display. If you have young people, you gotta get them there. Even if you have if you're young at heart, you gotta get there. <laughs> So, so this ark was built to the Hebrew long cubit, which is 20.4 inches. And it was 510 feet long, or it is 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall, again, based on the Hebrew long cubit. I just happen to have a cubit in my museum here. And, and it's the size from basically the elbow to the tip of the finger. Now, I'm, I'm a little short of the cubit, of the 20.4 inch cubit. So what is a cubit? It says the length of the arc should be 300 cubits long, the breadth 50 cubits wide, and the height 30 cubits. Now the cubit ranged in length from about 17 and a half inches to 22 inches, and it was based on who the leader was at the time, right? Hey, this is my cubit now. If the world belongs to Bruce, Bruce today, that's my cubit. So using the 17 inch cubit, or the 17 and a half inch cubit, the ark would have been 437 feet long, almost 73 feet wide, and, and 44 feet tall. Using the 22 inch cubit, that goes to 550 feet long, 92 feet wide, and 55 feet high. Big structure, right? Not messing around a little rowboat. Let's assume that this is, we're going to build our entire model from here on out now with a cubit that's equal to 18 inches. With an 18 inch cubit, the ark would have been 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields for those sport fans. It would have been 75 feet wide. That's two thirds of the width of the football field. And 45 feet tall, four stories tall. Large boat. And we can compare the size of modern ships to the Ark. And if you look at it, no recent ship, we're talking recent ship, wasn't built this large until 1860. But even if you look at the Titanic that was built in 1912, it's only about 300 feet longer than the Ark was. And there's other books or other boats in, in ancient history that actually also were very large, almost parallel with the Ark was, but not quite. So let's look at some of those. The Leon Tifra, these are 280 BC with the Greeks. The fleet of Demetrius, the Syracusa, the Tesserican Teres, and the fleet of Cheng Ho, which was a lot later in the 1400s. So let's just look at a few of these. The Leon Tifra was the largest of Lysimachus, which was the successor to Alexander the Great. So this was during the Greeks. It fought in an Aegean Sea battle in 280 BC. And James Usher, Bishop Usher, who was around in the 1600s, used earlier records that he copied that describes of this ship. It says, the largest ship of all had eight tiers of oars. Eight tiers of oars. She was admired by all for her large size and exquisite construction. In her were a hundred oars per tier, so that on each side there were 800 rowers, which meant 1,600 in all. On the upper deck or hatches, there were 1,200 fighting men who were under two special commanders. So if you think about this, in an airline, you know, in, in a plane, you don't have a lot of room. You probably need about three feet if you're rowing. So if you had 100 rowers on each side and three feet between them, that's at least 300 foot, and that's the bare minimum, right? There was probably more like four or five feet with these long oars, so probably close to 500 foot long. Plutarch, in his book, Life of Demetrius, says, this is about the fleet of Demetrius, he says, up until this time, no man had seen a ship of 15 or 16 banks of oars. However, in the ships of Demetrius, their beauty did not mar their fighting qualities, nor did their magnificence of their equipment rob them of their usefulness, but they had speed and effectiveness, which was more remarkable than even their great size. 
And we see in the complete works of Athanasa, the Syracusa, uh, it was designed by Archimedes. Remember, he's the one that de developed the, the hand pump the, the, that was able to pull the water up and also discovered buoyancy and was able to tell the weight of the king's crown. Remember that story? So it was designed by him and built by the ancient Greeks Hieron, or, or for Hieron, who was kind of this tyrant ruler at that time in, in Syracuse and Sicily. It says, when he had understood that there was no harbor in Sicily large enough to admit this ship, and moreover that some of the harbors were dangerous for any vessel, he determined to send it as a present to Alexandria to Ptolemaeus, the king of Egypt. They didn't have a harbor long, big enough to sail this thing. And the Terracin, 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 it's a hard one to get out. Built by Ptolemy, Ptolemy IV in 244 to 205 BC, 420 feet long, 75 or 72 feet tall, 45 feet wide, 4,000 rowers in 40 ranks. More than 8,000 men on board, a vast quantity of supplies. And Actually, they believe that this is more like a catamaran style, but still a huge boat, a huge boat. And then about 100 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right, we have the, the treasure fleet of Cheng Ho. He was a Chinese admiral, and he explored the Indian Ocean looking for a, a water route to Asia. And he had a fleet of 62 ships, and four of them were some of the largest in history, 400 to 500 feet long, 160 to 240 feet wide. This is a small little scale replica of, of what something that massive would have looked like. So there are other historical boats as well that were as large. And doesn't that make sense that they would model some of these after Noah's boat? I mean, after all, he's, he's the one that built the one that survived the big one, right? So why wouldn't you use the model for that boat? We'll see that a little bit later. So, so even with the size of the ark, how did Noah get all the animals in there? Right? Paul's got the question. We've got the answer. God says, take two of each kind and seven of each of all the clean animals, and it also says it takes seven of each of the birds as well. So remember, these aren't species, these are animal kinds. So when you look at our modern taxonomy classifications, probably, you know, you go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Uh, Mark Barnes in our Sunday school class knew this. I had to write down the name and remember it. But family is what most creation scientists believe that, that this animal kind represents, much smaller than species. So these are hybrid animals right here, just a, a few examples of a hybrid am, animal. This happens to be a cross between a camel and a llama. The, the male is generally what takes the first part of the word that's described them, and the female that follows. The zorse, the male zebra, and a female horse. A liger is a lion and a tiger, and a wolfing, a whale and a dolphin. These are separate species, but of the same kind. So the horse and the zebra, different species, the horse kind, the cat kind, the whale kind. And really, there's a new science that's being developed right now that's called baraminology. It's, it's taken from two Hebrew words, bara that means created, and min, which means kind. So it's the study of created kinds. And so they're looking at as long as you can have two species that can, can have offspring and that offspring is fertile, that's part of the created kind. We have greater than 300 different dog varieties right now, right? We had a golden retriever, there are Plumbians, there are Chihuahuas, there are Great Danes, there's a whole bunch of dogs out there. Most of them are because of selective breeding that's happened over just really the last couple hundred years. So Noah didn't need to take 
two of the, the lion dog, and two of the beagle, and two of the collie, and two of the great dane. You just had to take, what, two of the dog kind, like maybe wolf or dingo or something, that had all the genetic material to get all the dog kinds that we have today. It didn't need all the different varieties. In fact, you can take two golden retrievers right now and mate them, and you're going to get a poodle. No, you're going to get another golden retriever. Right. You've lost the genetic variety, and the only way you can get that back is if you breed the golden retriever with a wolf, and then you reintroduce a lot of the genetic material again that has the diversity. Same thing with horses. We didn't have to take the Clydesdale or the Shetland Pony. No, I had to take two of the horse kind. So that really cuts down the number of animals on the ark. So you're asking, well, then how many were there? So let's take a look. Secular scientists say that there are 3,700 species of mammals. But we already know that whales and dolphins are mammals, and they, they live in the water. We have otters and sea lions and seals, and they spend a great deal of time in the water. So maybe they didn't even have to go on, on board the ark. Certainly the whale didn't have to go on the ark, right? <laughs> so God didn't have to worry about that one, but I don't think it would have been a problem for God. But for the sake of argument, let's put all 3,700 species of mammals on the ark, shall we? There are 8,600 different species of birds out there. But you have a lot of waterfowl, right? Ducks and geese. We got some hunters in here. <laughs> would have been good picking season for Brad. Right? <laughs> would, would have been any left to repopulate the earth, though. <laughs> so some of those waterfowl, I mean, they could have survived outside the ark, right? It's very possible. It only rained for 40 days. So it's, it's possible that they could have floated on some debris as well. But let's make it as hard as we can for poor Noah, shall we? Let's put all 8,600 species of birds on there. There are 6,300 species of reptiles in the world today. Sea snakes, sea turtles, again, live in the water. They don't need to be on the ark. Those are just a couple of examples. But let's dump all of those on the ark, too. What about amphibians? We have crocodiles and alligators, and they live a lot of time in the water. Again, those are just examples, but let's dump all those on the ark, too, right? Let's make this as, as difficult as we possibly can in our little model. So what about the fishes and the arthropods and the worms and the mollusks and all these other animals? Right? They live in the water. I don't think no one would have to take those on the ark at all. So we're not going to put those on the ark. So in total, out of over a million different animal species, right, we're only looking at maybe 21,100 that had to be on the ark should have, would have been much smaller because we're talking about animal kinds, not species, right? So if you had 21,100 species and a mom and dad, that's 42,200 animals. Let's throw on there the clean animals, which would have been, what, those animals that were used for sacrifice, ox, sheep, ram, those kind of things. That's interesting because Noah's supposed to take seven of each of those clean animals, right? Any thought why? Couldn't sacrifice them. You think they'd sacrifice all of them? No. There were three sons, right? So if each one of those sons took a pair, that leaves one left of every, all, the, all the clean animals for the sacrifice. So let's, let's give Noah's sons a little chance in life to start breeding some of his uh, animals here. So, 7,800 clean animals, let's, I mean, we'll kind of add that in there. That's very conservative. That makes a nice round number, 50,000, right? It makes my math easier. <laughs> but creationists think, who do this bare monology, think there could have been less than 2,000 kinds on the ark, so much smaller. But we're going to keep the 50,000 animals. We won't throw them overboard yet, not until the storm gets rough. So let's look at the capacity of the ark. 
and we're going to use the smallest cubit. This is a, this is 20.4 inch. We're going to use a 17 and a half inch cubit again to make the smallest arc that we possibly can. So given that the arc had one and a half million cubic feet of capacity. That's equivalent to 522 railroad stock cars. If you take those 522 railroad stock cars and you line them up in a train, it's six miles long. Folks, that'll stretch from 95th and Metcalf to 143rd and Metcalf. That's a lot of cars on that train, a lot of capacity. So we do know there are a lot of big animals, right? Elephants. What else? Are, what, name a couple of the big animals. Giraffes are tall. Rhinos. Rhinos, hippopotamuses. Is that all, all the big ones you can name? Horses. Horses. They're still not as big as an elephant, but I can name a whole bunch of small animals, right? <coughs> Mice. Rabbit. Rabbit. Chipmunk. Squirrel. Chipmunk. Birds. Ducks. Geese. Chickens. I mean, I can go on and on and name small animals. So, creationists say that today the average size of animals are about the size of a sheep. Right? If you take all of the animals that we have, the average size is about the size of a sheep. Okay. You get 240 sheep in a railroad stock car. And you say, wow, yeah. Why well, Mike say, you're packing them in pretty tight, brother, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, but, yeah, but really. Is this a luxury cruise liner where everybody gets their separate cabin? No. This is a survival voyage, right? So, so we're going to pack them in a little tighter. So if you have 50,000 animals, 240 animals per stock car, folks, that's only 208 stock cars. Out of the 522 cars that we have, that's only 40% of the capacity. That's 60% of the yard that remains for food, Water and what else? Recreation. <laughs> well, they had a pool. Yeah. <laughs> for for people, right? And and you got to remember that when God told Noah to build an ark, He said, "You have 120 years before I f I destroy this earth." He gave a 120 year warning. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, was he not? So this ark wasn't designed for eight people. It was designed to have many, many more people on board if they would have repented and turned from their wicked ways. So plenty of room. And remember, this is using a maximum number of animals, species, and a minimum size for a cubit for the ark. Here's another question. If it was just a local <coughs> flood, why did Noah have to build such a big ark? Because all he had to do was take the animals from the Mesopotamian Valley, right? Mm -hmm. He wasted a lot of time and a lot of resources to build an ark that size if he only needed to do it for a local flood. So here's the question you've been waiting for tonight, right? So, were there dinosaurs on the ark? Did God say bring two of every land animal? And to, to so actually seven of, of each bird. So yeah, there's there's some like the plesiosaur, their their ocean, but you have the dinosaurs and then you have the pterosaurs. So were they land animals or birds? Yes. Were they on the ark? According to God's word, yes. Right. So what are the major objections here? Anybody? Sorry. So yeah, I mean right here, yeah. <laughs> How do they get the how they get the big ones on the ark, right? True. What's another objection? They were smaller. Yeah, yeah, the dinosaur could have been smaller. We'll, we'll get to that. None of them still exist. Bingo. Most people say dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. They weren't around when man was. Right? That's a huge problem that a lot of people have. What's something else? T-Rex had what? Big T. <laughs> All those other animals would have been breakfast, right? Yeah. And and what's it, what's the last one? This, this may be a little difficult, but there, you know, we didn't account for any dinosaurs. There are a lot of dinosaurs, 
lot of species of dinosaurs, right? We're going to get into all those. Actually, we're not going to talk about whether dinosaurs and man live together. That's another section. I, I got another lecture for that, so probably you're going to have to hold on. We'll have to invite you back. Uh, so that's going to be a later topic. We already talked about whether dinosaurs would have eaten anything, right? Before the flood, the Bible says, God says, I give you every green plant to eat. He said that about the animals and about man. So before the flood, everybody was a vegetarian, including the animals. It was only after the flood where God says, just as I gave you all the green plants to eat, I now give you everything to eat. And he made that same statement to animals and man. So let's look at the first obvious one then tonight, and that's how big were they? And even the largest dinosaur was small at one time, right? Yep. I mean, to, to our knowledge, all the dinosaurs were reptiles. All reptiles come out of eggs. And, and yes, there were some large dinosaurs, but there were an awful lot of small ones. I mean, a lot of them were the size of chickens. And again, creation scientists, when they look at all the fossil evidence that they had, they said the average size of a dinosaur was the size of a bison. Well, we have Rome and the Great Plains during the time of the Indians. So they all started small at birth. And, and here's a study that was done by Gregory Erickson. He was a paleontologist at Florida State University. Like most of our secular colleges, not a bastion of Christian theology down there, right? But he studied bones of dinosaurs to see if they had growth spurts. And what he found out, and this, this is just looking at one of the dinosaurs, but they were all very similar. This is the Apatosaurus, which is one of the big ones. And they started very small, like maybe a ton or so. And then when they were about eight years old or so, until they were about 12, 13, they had this huge growth spurt. Five tons per year is what they were known to grow as. So would Noah have taken grandma and grandpa dinosaur on the ark? No, he's, he's looking down in here, right? So they were on the ark for 371 days, a little over a year. So by the time they, the apotosaurus got on the ark to the time where he left the ark, not much growth spurt there. So is it feasible that dinosaurs could fit on the ark? Here's another relic in my museum. It's not really real, or otherwise I'd make you leave a donation at the door. But <laughs> this is a Oviraptor egg. It's a, it's a facsimile of one from, from a real one. But this is the size of an egg that the Oviraptor came out of. The Oviraptor wasn't huge. That's, that's the Oviraptor next to man, is 1.8 meters tall, roughly 6 feet. But it just shows you can get something fairly big that comes out of a little egg, right? So that's the answer to how'd you get the big dinosaurs on the ark, right? So what about the numbers of dinosaurs, the number of different dinosaur species? Has anybody heard of the bone wars? This is a tree. This is, this is for me, it was fascinating. Bone wars were in the late 1800s. And it started between these two gentlemen, Othniel Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. They were buddies. They were friends. They were amateur paleontologists, if you will, and they did a lot of dinosaur digging in those late 1800s on the eastern side of the United States. But it's, it's, you get a lot of notoriety when you find the next dinosaur, right? So you get to name the dinosaur, and your name is in the headlights. And it got pretty heated here. Everybody, there was this huge competition to find the next dinosaur and to name it. And so the competition really increased between these guys until the legend has it that Marsh paid off workers in Cope's camp to send all the fossils that they found to Marsh. So that really started the Bone Wars, but it, it really took on a whole new light here when Cope received this giant plesiosaur fossil from a Kansas military doctor, right? A Kansas military doctor here. 
He named it the Elasimosaurus. Problem was that in his exuberance of putting this fossil together, which again, you don't find the whole skeletons very often, so this is, this is pretty remarkable. But in his exuberance to put it together and to get his name published in his next journal, he put the head on the wrong side. <laughs> the head was supposed to go on the long side of the long neck, and that was the tail. So that was Cope's blunder. Marsh was quick to respond to this, and he gleefully pointed this out. And, and Cope actually spent a small fortune trying to buy up all these publications to save his reputation and his name. So, quite a blunder that, that Cope made. But just so you don't think that Marsh was clean, we'll tell you a story about Marsh during these bone wars. In 1877, he found just a couple of vertebrae and a, a fragment of a hip from a dinosaur, and from just those fragments, he said, this is a new species. This is a, called a patasaurus, right? We saw the, the growth curve of the patasaurus, how big it got so quickly. A couple of years later, in a different location, he found some other fragments, again, just fragments. And, oh, we found another species. It's called Brontosaurus. How many people remember Brontosaurus? Yeah, uh, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, it doesn't exist, but we'll tell you why. In that same dig, later, they found a lot more bones of the Brontosaurus. So he said, okay, look at this. Well, in 1903, the scientists looked at the Apatosaurus and the Brontosaurus, and they said, these are bones from the same dinosaur species. And according to the rules of paleontology, the Brontosaurus goes away because they stick with the first name. Right? So the Brontosaurus is on its way out. Got even worse. The head was a completely different dinosaur species called the Camarasaurus. But he placed that on his Brontosaurus, and the rest of the paleontologists kind of had this hint that, yeah, something doesn't seem quite right here. In 1910, in another excavation in Utah, they found the right head for the Apatosaurus. This is a picture of 1934 in the Carnegie Museum and this is the, the old brontosaurus, new apatosaurus, with the wrong head. <laughs> Even though in 1910 they found the true apatosaurus, they didn't replace it on top of the right body until 1979. So I grew up and I learned about brontosaurus. Did anybody, Charlotte, are they still teaching brontosaurus today? No, he doesn't exist anymore today, only by name, name only. So if you, if you really study it, there's probably only about 50 dinosaur kinds. Now, Cope and, Wa and Marsh worked furiously to, to find the next dinosaur species and name it after them, right? But in their haste, they did what? They mixed up the bones and called it something new. A lot of times they found the adolescent dinosaur fossil and they said, oh, smaller, different species. No, just smaller version of the mom and dad. So they misnamed a lot of dinosaurs. And by the end of the bone wars, there were about 142 new species of dinosaur that, that Marsh and Cope came up with. But when you take out all the ones that were duplicates or mixed up bones, there are only about 32 or so actual different dinosaur species that they had found. So when you look at dinosaur kinds, probably only about 50. Not much that you really had to put on the ark in addition to all the animals that we talked about, right? So now let's look at the design of the ark itself. Um, we've seen how, how it's large enough, but what about the shape? Because a lot of people will say, oh, it couldn't survive the big catastrophic flood that you guys are talking about anyway, right? 
Well, let's take a look at that. What was the ark made of? Wood. Yeah, we don't know what kind of wood that he used. Go for wood. <laughs> go for wood, right? So the Bible only uses go for this word go for once. And so it's hard from the context to really know what kind of wood it was. But God's the creator of the universe, right? It wasn't beyond him to say, hey, no, we're going to let you build a boat. We're, we're going to make it out of balsa wood, right? Balsa wood is very light wood, snaps like with your finger, easier than a toothpick. No, God's going to say, let's use a heavy wood. So God wouldn't take anything to chance. He would have said, this is the wood you're going to use, and it's going to withstand what, the battering of the waves, so it had to be strong, had to be such that it, it wouldn't expand or shrink underwater to let water leak in, and it had to be what? Waterproof. Waterproof, because it was in the, in the water for over a year, right? So it couldn't be subject to wood rot if it's exposed to water all the time. So... Let's look at some wood examples that we know of today, right? When you're talking about dense wood, it's hard to beat ebony and what's called <coughs> lignum vitae. Lignum vitae weighs 83 pounds per cubic foot. A cubic foot of wood weighs 83 pounds. That's dense wood, right? The strength is incredible. It, it will withstand 29,000 pounds of force per square inch. That's strong wood. You have to have a titanium tip blade to cut that wood. Uh, pardon? Uh, actually, this, this does grow in portions of southern Florida out, out there on the real southern portions, but a lot in Central America uh, grows a lot there. Another one is uh, Brazilian ipewood. Has anybody heard about Brazilian ipewood? Very dense wood also. Has the same fireproof rating as concrete. Well, if, how'd they cut that? No, it must have had some technology, right? They didn't have electricity back then. <laughs> not, not for power saw, right. But we'll, we'll get to the technology part here in a second. But if, if you take one of these dense pieces of wood and you throw it in the water, it sinks. That's how dense it is. Is that a problem to build a boat out of? Yep. Yeah. What are our cargo ships made of today? Steel. Does steel flow? Yes. The volume on the tides. But if you just take a chunk of steel and drop it in the water, it's going to sink just like this heavy wood. So that's not a problem for building ships out of, right? When I was in college, we were belonged to an organization called American Society of Civil Engineers. Every year there was a competition for a concrete canoe race. We built concrete canoes. I built one, I never floated in one. I didn't trust my own, <laughs> own design skills. <laughs> but they do float. So here's what we know about the word ark. It's also not used very often in scripture. The Hebrew word is teba, and it's, it's really only used in two occurrences. One's what we're talking about, Noah's flood, or Noah's ark, and the other time it's used, this is the basket, teba, that Moses was placed in when they sailed him down the Nile River to escape the judgment of the Pharaoh when he was killing all the infants. Only two occurrences that, that this word is used in the Bible. So given that, we do have God's recorded instructions of how to build the ark, right? Or at least the size. It was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high using the small cubit. There were three decks, upper, middle, and lower. And there were rooms inside, cages inside. The roof was finished 18 inches from the top, and he was supposed to put a door in it. And that's pretty much all we have that's recorded. And many people say, well, it's got to be a barge then. It's got to be a shoebox. But I think that's reading something into the text that isn't necessary. Because with just a few little modifications here, it could be a ship that would be more comfortable and more seaworthy than just a barge. And, and incidentally, God 
told Noah 120 years before the flood this was going to happen. I don't think this is probably the only conversation that Noah and God had. It's the only recorded one. But I don't believe God would have left this up to chance, even though Noah probably was very equipped and very studious in building ships. Um, I don't think he would have left that to chance. So now let's talk about the, the technology. <laughs> We don't know how dense the wood was that Noah used. It could have been the, the construction method where he's got lap siding and you know on the inside that shifts in the ark encounter. It, it explains a lot of the, how the ark could have been built. But we do know that technology in the in the beginning, a lot of people have a misconception that man was pretty primitive. But history proves that we lose technology. Because we still don't know how they built the pyramids. <laughs> Right? Some of those blocks weigh hundreds of tons, and nobody knows how they built them, especially in the time frame that they built them in. Romans invented concrete. That concrete is still existing today. We can't build something that will last that long out of our concrete. We're going back, actually looking at concrete that the Romans built to see what it was and how we can build things better. So we've lost a lot of technology. So it's, it's not surprising then that Noah had some technology, maybe not the tungsten tip blades, but certainly didn't need power tools. I mean, he would have had some technology to build this massive ship. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the ark could have looked like. But before that, there's, there's two basic ways that we can interpret scripture, right? There's two keys of, of interpreting scripture. One is exegesis, that's, that's pulling words out of the text to derive its meaning from the grammatical historical context. And then there's eisegesis, right, where that is taking man's fallible ideas and inserting them into the text to get the meaning that he wants it to have, right? We never want to use eisegesis when we're trying to, to understand scripture. So where it's, where it's strongly, I mean, when the Bible says something and, and there's no doubt about it, you have to adhere strongly to those principles. But where the Bible is kind of silent on stuff, it gives us a little bit of freedom to add into Scripture. Because we don't have a specific shape mentioned of the ark, right? We have the dimensions. We do know that ships tend, barges that is, shoebox ships, they tend to turn parallel to the waves. So imagine if the waves are rolling in here from your left to right. right? It's a constant barrage of waves. Generally a barge structure will align itself with the waves hitting a broadside that's called broaching. It's a bad thing to happen because the ship can capsize. So the idea is, well, what if there was some, you know, some ship modifications that could be made here that would make it maybe a little more seaworthy, a little safer? So just modifying this a little bit, you know, Scripture doesn't say what the shape is. It says what the length is and the dimensions are. So we can't, <coughs> we can't go against that. But what happens if you put some other features on it? Maybe a maybe a fin on the on the stern side and, and you know a bow you know object on the on the front side. So if you add a fin, something that catches the wind, the wind's blowing where the waves are. If it hits the stern, what does it do? Like a weather vane, turns the bow into the wave. Right? Makes sense. What about the, the bow of the boat? Because now you've got, it, you've got it facing into the wave, but now if it's just a blunt object, now those waves are pounding against the front of the ark. Does it make for a real smooth ride? This is what's called a bulbous bow. And it's, it's a protrusion under the water layer, and it cuts down on drag, allows the boat to go faster, so it's more efficient, it gives it a smoother ride. 
So these are maybe just some features that Noah may have known about and said, hey, this will make the ship a little more seaworthy, more comfortable, so it's not going to batter the animals around in the ark. So here's an example of this bulbous bow. This is the shape of the bow, of a bulbous bow. This green wave is the result wave that, that hits the boat when you have a bulbous bow. Notice where it breaks just before the ship, not right on the, the face of the bow. The blue line represents a conventional bow. And note this wave that breaks right at the base of the ship. If you have the shape of a conventional bow plus the bulbous bow, look what happens. These waves tend to cancel each other out, just like sound waves of different frequencies, and it cancels each other out. So what we see is the flow would have been a lot smoother across the, the arc. So if you think about this, we see this kind of design in Greek warships. Again, no one would have passed down shipbuilding to his ancestors, right? They would have said, I'm going to build my boat again, looking like the one that survived the big one. Don't need it that size, but I want the same features. So we see things like wind catching devices here that were supplemented again later with sails. But even, even ships that have sails in them, they take them down in huge storms, right? So Noah's Ark didn't need a sail. But look at this bulbous bow. Now remember that the Greeks also used these for ramming to poke holes in the other ships. But I think this was a, a remnant. I think they knew that a bulbous bow cuts down on drag and makes their boat go faster. Man, this is just now just an ancillary device here where I can ram other ships. I think that came about later. And, and if you look at early Mesopotamian pottery, right, which, which came not long after the flood, we have this same type of bulbous bow in all the, the pottery that we have. So it's very possible that, that Noah's Ark had some of these similar features. And I, I won't be dogmatic about that. There's people that will disagree. But I think that still allows to be true to the biblical text of this size, but there's no mention of shape. This is a steel cargo ship. Ratio-wise, length, width, and height, a lot of similarities to Noah's Ark. Look at the bulbous bow in the front of that. We still use that today. We modeled that either after the, the Greeks or the Mesopotamian, or we got that and just rediscovered it because it makes sense with what the boats do today, right? Now, there was a 1993 study done at a famous ship research center <coughs> in Korea, South Korea. And what they decided, that they used a lot of different combinations of, of these characteristics to build ships. The hull, the, the height of the hull, and, and the taller it is, the stronger it is. Stability, the wider it is, it's not going to capsize as easy. And then the length, the longer it is, the better for a smooth ride because now it can ride on two crests of waves. And, and today they call that hogging because now it settles in the middle. So if it's too large, if it's too long, you have problems. And, and, and everybody remember the Edmunds Fitzgerald? I'd love to sing that song for you. I won't. But the Edmunds Fitzgerald was on the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, and the, those waves were a little choppier than what you'd find on Ocean Sea, and a lot of people think that's what happened. It was too long for the waves, and it was supported by waves here and here, and it broke apart in the middle and settled at the bottom. So you have to be careful about having too long of an arc. Well, the study looked at several combinations of these three characteristics, and they said that Noah's Ark was right in the sweet spot based on the study from a ship research center that's not Christian. They said the dimensions of the ark would have made it an average performer in any one of the areas 
but when it's they're all combined, it was the best design overall, taking into consideration all three of those. Not by accident, was it? So finally, God also told Noah to cover the inside and outside with pitch. And the word for pitch is kofer. And it actually means a covering or a ransom or, or price paid for a life. And, and pitch was a perfect substance to keep the waters of judgment out of the ark, was it not? Inside and outside, kept the inhabitants safe inside. But this wasn't just an ark. This was an ark of salvation, right? No put one door in the ark. Everything that came in through that one door was saved from the judgment. And what's that a picture of? Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And when you look at the picture of Christ's blood as a perfect covering, a cofer for us on the Ark of Salvation, I think that's a picture of Jesus Christ. If you come into the Ark of Salvation today, you'll be saved, just like Noah and all the inhabitants were then. So that's all I have this week. I kept you a little long this week because I, I shortchanged you last time. So thank you for being with me today.